everyone, in this video we'll talk a little bit about back pain and the terminology used to describe it. Let's start with one of the terms called spondylosis. Spondylosis, as the name implies from its Greek origin, spondylos means spine and multiple levels of the spine. By adding the IS, we're really referring to broad degenerative changes of the spine. However, when we talk about spondylolysis, adding the lysis term to it implies there's some break. And we'll review what that means, but usually we're talking about a break in the pars interarticularis. Finally, we have spondylolisthesis, which means displacement of one virtual body in relation to the other one. Terms used to describe spondylolisthesis can be anterolisthesis or retrolisthesis. However, it should be noted that while a lot of times when we have spondylolisthesis, we have an underlying pars defect and therefore spondylolysis, the terms are not necessarily always related. For example, you can have spondylolysis without having spondylolysthesis, and you can have spondylolysthesis without having spondylolysis. So that's an important distinction to have in mind when you're reading a report or talking about uh, use about back pain using these terms because they imply different things and uh, some people might use them interchangeably and it's good to have in mind what they really mean. Let's go and review the basic anatomy of a virtual body. Here we're looking at axial planes of a CT of the lumbar spine. You see the virtual body anteriorly, you see the spinal canal in this region where the spinal nerves will start arising from and we have the facet joints. This is a fairly normal spine, and you see the uniformity of the facet joints. You don't see any irregularities or any hypertrophy of the joint. However, compared to this one, in which you see already a hypertrophy of the facet joint, with it, which is this area here, so you see this is uh, much more larger than compared to the other one, which was a normal one. So this type of degeneration is one of a, the one common cause of back pain uh, called facet pain and it usually causes rotational type of pain. So the, the patient will have problems moving uh, in a rotatory manner. You have uh, growth, like I said, and MRI, you can also see hypertrophy of the ligament and flavum sometimes, and uh, you can possibly see a disc bulge, and all those factors contribute to narrowing of the spinal canal. That could be another cause of back pain. So just in this image, we are reviewing two different joints to the right and the left sided facet joint, which can result in back pain in addition to the fact that a patient can have a posterior disc bulge or uh, some other causes for narrowing of the spinal canal that can also result in pain. So here I'm showing you the normal facet joint on the left. However, on the right, with the pointed by the red arrow, we have an irregularity, and that's actually a pars defect. So that's a, a defect sometimes referred to as a fracture. Uh, it, it is important to know that th there might be different etiologies or causes for this type of defect, and it's also important not to distinguish, not to confuse it and distinguish it from the adjacent facet joint. So here we're starting to see a little bit of the facet joint. Uh, however, this is the pars defect here. I'll show you another example in a minute, but remember pars defect is essentially the same thing as spondylolysis and also often referred to as a pars fracture. However, uh, the preferred terminology is usually pars defect because we don't really know uh, if this is a congenital finding or if it was a fracture and, and therefore pars defect is a more appropriate term. On this image, we see another example, uh, an axial view of a pars defect, and you can see the irregularity here. Uh, and again, it's a little bit more interior than where, whatever you would expect your, your normal facet joint to appear on an axial CT. Uh, finally, I'm showing you the sagittal plane in which we have a normal pars, so the pars will be this area here, and in the level below, you can see there's a defect. So that's another way of looking at it uh, on the sagittal plane, and uh, it really represents the same thing. And you, remember, you can have spondylolisthesis as a result of a pars defect. 
In this example, I show you uh, an MRI of the lumbar spine. However, the idea for this one is to show you that sometimes you can have enterolysthesis, and in this case, we would probably call a grade one L5, since it's a uh, L5 virtual level, uh, grade one L5 S1 enterolysthesis, and it it is resulting, although we don't see a parse defect clearly here, um, or or we cannot really assess the parse, I should say. Uh, there's a relative narrowing of the spinal canal, so this makes me suspect that the type of enterolysthesis of spondylolysthesis that I'm seeing here is really a degenerative type. And I know I haven't gone over the details or the classifications of this, but the most important distinction is to know that you can have enterolysthesis with or without a parse defect, and when you don't have a parse defect, it's usually considered a degenerative type of enterolysthesis due to laxity of the ligaments. So there's really no defect there, it's just the laxity of the ligaments. And the problem with that is that that causes narrowing of the spinal canal and it can cause some spinal canal compromise. When you have a parse defect, you'll have the same migration, however, the spinal canal doesn't get narrowed because there's a fracture, so it's not pulling on the posterior elements of the spine as it migrates anteriorly. So that's something to have in mind, and it's really the most important distinction uh, that you should know when talking about enterolysthesis, whether there's a, an underlying parse defect or not. And that's the area of possible narrowing. Like I'm saying, uh, I don't really see the facet, and uh, so it, it's really a hypothetical situation in this case. But in a, in a full exam, you would uh, know whether there's a defect or not on the parse.